I'm going to read our Bible verse again from Matthew 5, verse 30 to 40. It says this in God's word. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. These set of verses which I read out to you this morning are well known, aren't they? But do we really understand them? These words are familiar to the world as well. And because of that, they have contempt for them. Beyond times, Paul, he preach and teach and treat God's word without the due diligence it deserves. So we lose Christ's meaning and we try to put modern values and traditions upon his word. We've forgotten that Jesus was wild and predictable and radical. And these are very radical teachings, if we understand them. He spoke, not to us, remember, but the people who were in front of him who understood the world and spiritual matters, completely different to ourselves. We have a, a chorus, don't we? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Well, you don't have any, any eyes in your heart, do you? But of course, they thought their heart was the centre of their being. So to, that, to them, it would make sense. While Jesus spoke in parables to help the people understand what he was saying at the time, generally they failed to comprehend what he was saying. Yet the Pharisees and Sadducees had a glimmer of understanding. The rulers of the temple. And because of that, they knew how dangerous Jesus was. And if you're a follower of Christ and you understand his word, then you're a very dangerous person to be around. Yet in our post-Christian modern world, where people attempt to deconstruct their faith in the Bible, they fail to comprehend or understand what Jesus actually said. For this lack of background and understanding of who and what our God and faith is, it means that we fail to consider the context of the words and when they were spoken by Jesus. And the church has allowed the world and our lack of understanding and who and what Christ was and is and the word that he has given us. We've allowed them to become diluted. So the teaching that they once, that he gave, they lack the great power which really they contain, and they seem impotent to us now. So what do these words mean? What power sh should they have, especially the impact that they should have it on our lives? Why is it that we do not understand them? It says in our reading, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. Now for the modern audience, what does this mean? The world believes that these words are based on abuse and so that they can abuse us and then we turn the other cheek for more abuse and because it's written in God's word we tolerate it because that's what it says this is because we've misunderstood the teaching that's right here given here and I pray that this morning that you would have a revelation of God's word this day so you would understand what Christ is saying to you in these words, bearing in mind he's wild and predictable and radical in his behaviour and teaching. These Bible passages are no exception to this. And once we understand what is being said, especially to the audience at the time, we would understand the world so differently for us in our time. In their time, left and right had great symbolic meaning. The left hand was seen as evil and unclean. The right hand, however, was portrayed as a blessing, had power and would bless people. God's right hand, after all, saved his people. God's power extends through his right hand. This does not mean that those who are left-handed were evil. And in fact, God used a left-handed man called Ehud, who was a judge, to great effect to save his people. And if you ever have Bible study, take a time to have a look at that. It's a an amazing story. The left hand was used for the unsavoury aspects of life at that time, such as the toilet, and the right hand was used as an instrument of eating. It's an insult even today to eat with your left hand in Middle Eastern countries. So what, with knowing all of this, what does this mean in reading? 
Now remember, we're not in the middle of a fight between two people here. It's a slap. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, he's saying, turn them the other cheek also. If someone is going to slap you on the right cheek, which hand would they use? The left. Right, the left, isn't it? The left. Which means their contempt, their unrighteousness for you, the evil that they contain, which they desire to impart, because that was an insult in their country at the time, that using their left hand to slap somebody across the cheek. The humiliation of that slapping, because it would be public and not done in secret, is slapping your righteous side and transferring their contempt to you so that you would feel shame on the contempt that they felt for you. And that was to diminish you and make you unrighteous. I say, Jesus is not talking about a fight here, but rather it slaps after all. Someone showing contempt for another. What Jesus is saying to us, if we then turn the other cheek towards them, what hand do they have to use to slap you? The left, isn't it? The left. They use the right, their right hand to slap you across your left cheek, which means the contempt the unrighteousness, the evil which they slapped you, transfers back. It means they take back the shame. They take back the contempt. And of course, it's public upon themselves. Rather than leaving you to suffer the shame and embarrassment. It doesn't mean that as Christians, we allow ourselves to be struck twice for no reason. This lack of us then has meant that we've allowed ourselves to be persecuted in this way for hundreds of years. Because we fail to hear what Jesus is really saying to us. There's somebody who has contempt for you and has slapped you with their left hand. Then turn the other cheek and they will slap you with their right hand, which means what they have done will return back to them. It's symbolic. It's meaning to do with the moving and unrighteousness, their contempt for an individual that has gone back to them and then lay and that lays upon them and they receive the the shame. The people of the time would have understood this immediately. But rather than employ this behaviour, they did in the past. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What Jesus is saying, no, let that poison pass back to the person who's inflicted it upon you. If they did employ eye for an eye, it meant the contempt was justified. But allowing that transfer meant that the person inflicting it was the one who was in shame. An embarrassment. What does it go on to say? And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. What does this mean for us? People are so in our world today, love to point us out, don't they? And they like to point towards and say, look what they have done. We're judged, aren't we? We're judged. Look what they have done. And that can be in a open forum. And we are told, look what they have done. And you can feel shame. In the days of Christ, they used to hold court in open spaces, usually by the gates of the city, so everyone would know what was happening and the judgments that were meted out. If someone was taken to court and fairly, and payment was demanded for goods and services that they had used and wouldn't pay for, then goods would be taken from them to meet the payment. This meant, as they were poor, they usually required the clothes that were on their backs. Jesus is saying, give to them your coat or cloak as well. In those days, under Roman rule, the Jewish people didn't own very much. Most of them were quite poor. There was one thing, however, that everyone had to his own, and that was his cloak or coat. A cloak was a very important piece of clothing. It was what kept them warm overnight. It also kept the sun off them during the day, and it served as a blanket or pillow at night. Their cloak was so important that in Exodus 22, 26, God commands that if a man takes another cloak as a pledge, the cloak must be given back before nightfall so they had something to sleep in. Underneath they would wear a shirt and the cloak would be on top of that. But if they were taken away by a person in court because they owed for goods or services or money, And they were taken away from court. So that was a shameful thing to do because, of course, the Jews didn't like naked bodies. 
This was shameful and would not be tolerated for very long. The one suing was trying to show their contempt for that individual. They owe me money and I want it back. I want it because it's mine. Not caring about the humanity of the one that they were taking to court in the first place. Jesus says, if someone is taking you to court, sort it out before you even get there. The process and the fact that this level of payment was demanded would bring shame upon the person attempting to bring righteousness upon them. They would be on public display and because of God's command in Exodus, the cloak must be returned at nightfall. I don't ever have stopped the rumours because they would see the process taking place out in a public arena that that person would almost be stripped naked. They would only have their loincloth only have their loincloth. And of course, the gossips would start. They would say, what happened to the man in court today? All was taken from him. He would be, that was a terrible thing to do. They would say that, you better have it back by nightfall because that was God has commanded us. Who won then in the case, in the people's eyes? Well, the one who had been sued had their judgment. The hunger for payment had overcome the humanity of one for another, which meant the one suing had received the contempt that they should have received in that judgment. Our reading continues. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, when the Romans ruled the Israelites, a soldier could go to any citizen and demand that they carry their backpacks for one mile one mile this was the soldier's right and the people had to comply they could just go up to the individual or persons and say right we want you lot or we want you as an individual take my pack follow me and we will walk along the road now the romans roads had uh, mile markers so they would know exactly how far a mile was the citizen had to carry the soldier's backpack this was the soldier's right and the people had to comply but they couldn't be forced to carry it any further. Roman roads had these mile markers, so everyone would know the distance. And if the soldier was caught and the citizen was still carrying the bag after the mile marker, then the soldier would be troubled with his commander. A punishment then would be made upon the soldier because he had broken the rule. And of course, that would be cause trouble between the people and the Roman rule. And the Romans understood this. But Jesus would say this is a subtle way of open defiance for a people under the occupation and how to get those who are persecuting you into trouble. <coughs> it appears they are doing them a favour when in fact the injustice and the contempt that these Roman soldiers would have for that individual had been laid upon back upon them. This is what these verses mean for us. This is what Christ was trying to teach these individuals. That you have power over your situation. That you have the ability to change what's going on within your life. And that how people then try to lay upon you contempt and unrighteousness. How you can pass it back to them. And show that you're acting in a godly way. This day I pray that you've glimpsed the true meaning of Jesus' words. You may see now how we've misused them and the world has misused them. And rather than see them as a way to push against the evil, the contempt of the world, rather you would change your behaviour and bring a blessing so that you would say, I'm not going to react in that way. What does it say in Christ's words that I should do in this situation? How can I turn back that issue that's laying into my life, that is upset in my life, that while they perhaps haven't physically slapped you, or they haven't abused you, that perhaps they've said it in words, or the way that they behaved, you could say, right, how would Christ, how would Christ then enable me to pass that contempt, that unrighteousness back to that individual that's hurting me? Jesus is saying, you don't have to meet violence or repay an evil when someone is trying to persecute you. Rather, he's encouraging you to behave in a different way and displaying who and what you are in God. For remember, you are the God that only this world will ever see. And depending upon your behaviour, how you suffer, what comes into your life, will directly affect how people perceive 
Christ in your life. If someone has contempt for you and they intend to humiliate you and you allow that process to continue, find a way with Christ to enable that to go back to them and behave as Christ has told you to behave. This shows to the world of what is being done to you and that evil then is shown where it lies. Let injustice, contempt and ridicule fall upon them and allow them to break the rules. This frees us as followers of Christ so we do not have to seek or plot revenge. We don't have to let these things boil up inside of us. Rather, they can be free from them. We do not have to respond like the world does. But rather than us receiving harm, we would receive blessing from God. He he can say, they're believing and acting out my word. We can then become unpredictable. We can then become dangerous. We can then become radical because we understand God's word. We can be generous when the demands are made of us and the world will see who and what we are and we see how we respond to those who would like to harm us and they would recognise that we are the people of God. We are the children. We are adopted heirs of he who is upon high and that we are the blessing that the world needs to receive. Let us pray.